So good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome to our 12th and last session of our lecture series, Moldova, uh, Shared and Divided History, Eine Geteilte Geschichte. I'm very glad to welcome my dear colleague from Czernivci, Natalia Nechayeva Yurichuk. She will talk today about the relationship between Moldova and the Ukraine, respectively the Moldavians and the Ukrainians. So I'm very curious what she has to tell us. Let me introduce her a little bit. She studied history at the National Yuri Fetkovich University of Chernivtsi with a focus on global history. And she also uh, completed her PhD in history there. She was a lecturer in various departments of the university and an assistant at the Department of New and Contemporary History, as well as at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration, where she has been teaching and researching as an assistant professor since 2017. She has completed several research and teaching visits abroad as she is currently doing at the University of Osnabrück as a part of the Erasmus Plus program. She has published widely on European and transnational history, identity, politics, post-Soviet transformation, security and border issues, including papers on Moldova, the Georgian-Russian conflict, and Northern Bukovina. Today, she will talk about the historical relations between Moldova and the Ukrainians and the Ukraine. So Natalia, floor is yours. Uh, could you unmute your microphone, please? You're muted in the moment. <laughs> I'm really sorry, that's my fault. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this very interesting and important project. And uh, I'm really glad and I'm really proud to be here and to talk a little bit about the uh, so long and so basic and fundamental relations about Moldavian and Ukrainian people, because we are always talking about the politics, about the huge political events, about the politicians, and I will definitely talk also about them. But uh, to keep in mind, uh, during the centuries, the land, the earth was, land, was uh, settled by different people, and we are all representing different nations. And the place from which I came, uh, Chernivtsi, is situated in Bukovina, and Bukovina was and still is the land where different nationalities are living and where different people uh, are finding their home. And right now, we see during the Russian invasion and the war which is occurring right now, we can uh, see that the uh, my native home, Bukovina, as well as many other places all over the world, especially all over the Europe, are becoming the new home for people who are suffering from Russian invasion. So to go to our topic, Moldova and Ukraine, the first question is, uh, to be honest, uh, dedicated to the question, what do we mean when we are talking about Moldova? I was thinking a lot about the topic I would like to speak with you and the topic which is more than interesting for me. And I was thinking what I'm going to talk, yes, and what is the main subject and the main territory. Uh, am I going to talk just about the Ukrainian-Moldavian relations in frames of contemporary borders? And if we are talking in uh, these frames, we have to keep in mind that just after 1991, we can speak about bilateral state relations between Ukraine and Republic of Moldova. Or we are talking about the Moldavian principality during the ruling of Stefan the Great around 16th century, and as far as we can see on this map, this territory is covering much more than contemporary territory of Republic of Moldova. And that also is very important for all of us. Here on these three maps, you can see the changes, historical changes of the 
vision of the Moldavian lands during centuries, and we can see how it has been changed for, from one point to another one. And uh, to be honest, um, I couldn't find the appropriate answer on my question, so I appreciate if you can assist me during our uh, cooperation, yes, and communication, but I will start probably uh, from the point of Moldavian and Ukrainian lands, because uh, we had no definite the same state as we have right now in early medieval times, in medieval times, in late medieval times, in uh, even beginning of 20th century. And later we will talk also about uh, the bilateral state relations. The same question is about Ukraine, because if you look on Ukraine and Ukrainian map, I think that many of you uh, just keep in mind the, the map you've seen at the beginning, at the end of February 20. 22, the map uh, where the uh, dots of uh, bombing from Russia were pointed, uh, and uh, the contemporary map of Ukraine, yes, where we can see the contemporary borders of our state, but also when we are talking about the uh, interaction between Ukrainian people and other people all over the world, especially neighboring people, we can talk not only about the interaction in frames of contemporary boundaries, but mainly we are talking about the Ukrainian lands, which are covering a little bit more territory historically and by settling of Ukrainian people. And here we can also see the lands of Ukrainian People's Republic of 1919, when Western Ukrainian Republic, People Republic and Ukrainian People Republic were united into the one and also uh, here we can see the lands of Kiev, Rus, and Kozak state, which are also right now the part of Ukrainian history and the part of uh, our uh, Ukrainian history and the part of vision of Ukrainian lands. So also when we are talking about the uh, interaction between Ukraine and Moldova, between Ukrainian people and Moldavian people, we will talk about different aspects, but mainly I would like to point out that the lands where mainly Ukrainian and Moldavian people are living are uh, famous by their tolerant interaction and mutual perception of each other. Moreover, this cultural interaction was so huge that uh, then that we can state that during uh, centuries the language was completely the same and people could understood each other and that was really very important for both sides and not only for a political or social uh, interaction but also for everyday communication between different people but I would like to start uh, from the uh, probably a little bit more ancient part of our common history, and that uh, is not only about the archaeology, I am sure that you were talking about this culture during your lectures, but also about my uh, personal experience during my studying at, our, at, at my Yuri Fitkovich Chernivtsi National University at the historical department. So during my first year, um, course, my first year studying on for, for, for history, we uh, provided so-called archaeological practice, which was pro provided not only in Ukraine, but also outside of Ukraine. And our year was the first one which uh, went to uh, neighboring Romania, and we were digging the so-called culture cucutane. To be honest, during that period of time, I didn't know a lot about this culture. And for me, that was like the new opening of a new life on a new culture of archaeology, new interaction, and perception, the idea that all of these lands have um, common past, and common uh, cultural past. So as far as we can see on this map, the culture Kukuten, which is famous in Ukraine, like uh, as Tripilska Kultura, so Tripilla, is uh, covered not only the territory of contemporary uh, Moldova and Ukraine, but uh, it covered territory of traditional or historical Moldovan lands. Part of it right now is the part of the Romanian state. So uh, here we can see the map and here we can see this 
culture Kukuteng. There are many different investigations on it, and I'm sure that you've read and you can find a lot of different and very interesting things about this culture. But this civilization uh, was on a vast area from the Carpathian Mountains to the middle of the Dnieper River. The total area of this culture was around 350,000 square kilometers, and uh, that was, as far as I told, the territory of contemporary Romania, Republic of Moldova, and Ukraine. Uh, the culture Kukuteng belongs to the earliest uh, civilizations and cultures of the sixth millennium before Christ. And to be honest, that was uh, one of the most, I'm not sure about the correctness of the full world powerful, but one of the most uh, influenceable culture for the further development of the Europeans uh, at that period of time. So that was so-called proto-urban, and there were a lot of cities which were quite large, from several uh, tens of hectares to 200, 400 uh, hectares in some cases. The houses of this culture were one or two-storied, and they were even divided into two, into several uh, rooms. That's very interesting that historians didn't find any administrative building, neither in Ukraine nor on, in Moldova in this culture, yeah? But the uh, pictures and the heritage of this culture was and still is uh, very important for all sides and for all nations which this culture is covering. So for example, for Ukrainians, Trepilia uh, means uh, the start of Ukrainian civilization. And the same point and the same attitude or similar attitude we can witness also in, Molde in Moldova, and that uh, culture is really very important for Moldavian de further development. Uh, on the territory of Moldova, settlements of uh, Kukuten culture were found near such uh, settlements as Varvariavka, Brinjerny, Variety, Kuban, and so on. So I'm not sure about the pronunciation of the of the titles, but uh, I hope that you uh, re remind them. If we are talking about Ukraine, in Ukraine, this culture was opened in 1896 by Ukrainian archaeologist Vikenty Hvojka, and that was the great opening for Ukraine. And also we are talking about Tripilia, so that's why it is called a Stripilla culture, and there were a lot of different huge cities in Ukraine which were representing the Kukuteni culture. So in this sense, we can talk about the everyday communication and interaction, proto probably Moldavian and proto-Ukrainian people, which were living on the same territories, producing similar products, and uh, organized one of the most famous and most interesting cultures of ancient world in European space, in Central Eastern European space. Of course, uh, we can talk a lot about different parts and different stages of our common history, but also we have to keep in mind that the next development of the territories means the development and managing of different stage spaces and different states. In 10th, 11th century of our um, era of our epoch, Moldavian lands became the part of Kiev Rus, and later they became the part of Galicia Volin Principality. And we can find a lot of different evidence, uh, both written and uh, other evidence, material evidence of a common uh, heritage of Moldova, Moldavian and uh, Ukrainian Rus people who lived at that period of time who communicated by a similar language and who understood each other. To be honest, um, we can find more information about the famous people, about principles, about the kings, about the knights, not about the ordinary people, but that part of the history was also very important. And if we are talking about it in Ukrainian perspectives, in, from Ukrainian point of view, that part of history means for us, uh, for me personally, uh, the strong communication and influence of Rus culture on surrounded territories. And that's like the part of our uh, national identification about which I will try to talk a little bit later. Uh, 
Uh, when we are talking about the later times, we can talk that in 1359, as the result of elections and the rebellion uh, against Hungarian rule, the Moldavian principality, which were organized a little bit earlier between 13th and 14th centuries, uh, I'm so, uh, uh, became independent. And the first ruler of Moldavian principality, Bogdan the first, uh, was before the vote in Maramures. And um, some evidence is, is talking that uh, his uh, name testifies, testifies that he has some Slavic or some Ruthenian or Rus origin. Also, we have to keep in mind that during next decades, next rulers of Moldova expanded the territory of Moldavian state. And in the 13th century, it was very interesting period for both states and for both uh, people. Yeah, because uh, Moldavian state was managed and organized and become more powerful and Ukrainian state or Kievan Rus became weaker and disappeared from the political map of the euro. So that was like the change uh, and some changes and, uh, um, on the political or geopolitical map of Europe in 14th, 15th century. Also, we have to uh, keep in mind that both territories, both Ukrainian and Moldavian lands lay in the uh, such part of, the, of Europe, which is very interesting for bigger or greater players like Lithuania at that period of time, Poland, Moscow, and Ottoman um, Empire. Uh, that wasn't, I'm sorry, that wasn't Ottoman Empire. Uh, that was like a uh, golden hork, but later, great hork, but later it was uh, an, a, another point of view. So uh, to be honest, this period of time, and we can see in this map or during this map, uh, became very important for both sides because here we can see Moldavia as the separate uh, union and a separate state. And we can find some Kievan principalities, but they are in frame of the greater Lithuanian uh, principality. And later it becomes a part of Rech Pospolita and Republic of Polsha. In 1569, Poland and, Lith and Lithuania signed so called the Union of Lublin and created Rech Pospolita. And Ukrainian lands became the part of uh, this Rech Pospolita. At the same period of time, Moldavian state uh, continued to develop at that period of time. And that's very important that the population of uh, this territory of uh, this state was also inhabited, uh, was also consisted of Ruthenians, of Orus people. Moreover, some evidence like written evidence are talking about not only the uh, ordinary population, but also aristocracy. And the capitals of medieval Moldavia, Sret, Suchava, Banya Moldova were located in the uh, Rus or Ukrainian ethnic territory. And uh, also the old Ukrainian language or uh, Rus language, Ruthenian language uh, was uh, spread all over the, the, those territories. So the Slavic or old Ukrainian or Ukrainian element uh, was one of the dominant in Moldova in medieval times and it influenced a lot on different spheres of life. Also we have to keep in mind that um, uh, the old Ukrainian language or Rus language uh, became the official language of the Moldovan state and many different documents were written by this language and we can find them both in archives and in different libraries, not only in Republic of Moldova, but also all over the world where they are right now situated. The first higher educational institution that appeared in Moldova was the Slavic Greek Latin Academy, which was mod modeled after the key of Mahila Academy, and it was opened in 1614 in Yase, and that was the strong influence of Petro Mahila, one of the more famous. Uh, it could be uh, accepted both as Moldavian and Ukrainian uh, philosopher, uh, leader uh, and um, strong supporter of higher education. Uh, during the Middle Age, many Ukrainian leaders and Cossacks considered Moldova as their territory. And that's very interesting to look into the history and to see 
how not only the ordinary people interacted because uh, it, it's very complicated to find the real evidence about it, but how uh, the representatives of uh, so-called passion, passionary uh, strata or uh, aristocracy wanted to gain some authority in other lands. For example, here you can see the picture of Dmitro or Baida Vishnevetsky, which was the founder of the Parisian or the Pariska siege. And in 1553, he uh, tried to become the ruler of Moldova. His attempt wasn't successful, but that was uh, one of the uh, attempts of Ukrainian Cossacks to uh, not only the gain the power in, the, in, in, in Moldova, but also to become the ruler and to influence and to realize in, uh, on that territory. The next uh, person who was more uh, successful was Ivan Pitkova, also the Ukrainian Cossack, and he became the Gospodar or ruler of Moldova in 1577. And that was also very, uh, very uh, interesting because he was the chieftain of Kosh, and uh, for, for some period of time he was for, for a very short period of time, but he was the master of Moldova. Uh, Severina Levaika, another one, also planned to create a Ukrainian Cossack state in Transnistria. So as far as we can see, at that period of time, in medieval time, in 16th century, uh, Ukrainian and Moldavian lands were connected may probably not so huge in the geopolitical term, but uh, in vision, perception, and understanding of different players on both sides. And this interaction between Moldavian rulers, Moldavian knights, and Ukrainian aristocracy was very, very important for both sides. Also, one of the uh, most famous um, histories in uh, Ukrainian history uh, were so-called Moldavian projects of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. So in 1648, the uh, war for independence or national uh, freedom war has been started on Ukrainian lands, which, be, which were the part of uh, Rech Pospolita of the uh, Polish kingdom. And uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky started this war for creating the uh, free Cossack state. Of course, you can find some other reasons, like personal reasons, but Bogdan Khmelnytsky has had two sons, and one of him, the oldest son, uh, Timish, was uh, his, um, uh, his, his hope for a future and for some strategic uh, unions between uh, Ukrainian Cossack states and other uh, knights and principalities and other uh, families, uh, aristocratic families all over the Europe. So he wanted very much to um, unite Moldova and Ukrainian Cossack state in one fam family. And he was in favor to marry his son with Rosanda, the daughter of a Moldavian hospital. So he did it. And uh, in uh, 1652, Bogdan Khmelnytsky's son, Timish Khmelnytsky, married the daughter of Moldavian landlord, Vasily Lupo, Rosanda. That gave uh, to uh, Khmelnytsky some uh, Round to probably in future to claim the Moldavian throne. But in 1653, uh, Timit Milinsky has died in a war. So that was like very short, but very uh, important project for both sides. And that was like also one of the um, examples of very fast and very important interaction in uh, this period of time. Uh, for me personally, um, Another point and another uh, part of Ukrainian history is very important. That the start of 18th century, the 1710, uh, the uh, uh, Orlik and adoption of its constitution, and it was done on 
historical Moldavian lands with the support of the people who lived there, because at the beginning of 18th century, Ukraine was again divided between different states and main part of Ukraine, so eastern part of Ukraine, a bigger part of Ukraine becomes a part of firstly Moscow Kingdom and later the uh, Russian Empire, uh, but um, part of the Ukrainian opposite Cossacks, which were not in favor of such division and such pro-Russian development or Russian development of Ukrainian lands left the Ukraine and went to Moldova because they felt themselves more secure there. And the first democratic constitution of the world was adopted uh, in Moldova in 1710. That was the, the first Ukrainian constitution, as far as I've told, and that uh, called Pact and Constitution of Rights and Freedoms of the Zaporizhia Army. Um, why it's so important? It didn't realize, so that's why we can talk about the American constitution as the first democratic one. But Ukrainian was famous uh, because it uh, opened the new democratic attitude towards the division of authority, so legislative and uh, another one. Uh, it was also with the high social protection of people, with the uh, division of budget, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we can see and we can state that uh, Moldova and Moldavian lands were something like the secure space for Cossacks, and not only for Cossacks, for many Ukrainian people who left Ukrainian lands after the conquering by Russian uh, Moscow and then Russian uh, troops. Yeah. And when Ukraine became the part of uh, Russia uh, to uh, Moldova because that was more secure for many of them. And that was also the basic or the ground for further inter interaction and mutual understanding of people who were living there. Here you can see the uh, memorial sign, which is right now situated in uh, Transnistria in Bandera Fortress. And that's very important because uh, if you look probably um like very fast on contemporary transnistria from ethnic cultural point of view we can we can find the, the evidence of presence of three nations like uh, moldavians ukrainians and uh, russians because of uh, different historical roots and as Ukrainian, uh, uh, I, I can find there a lot of evidence of Ukrainian presence, like the uh, constitution of Philip Orlik, monuments to Taras Shevchenko, and some other places. Also, we can find there some other things, and that was the land for real interaction between different people during the many centuries. 1775 became the turning year for Moldavian and Ukrainian lands. So as far as uh, all of you know, the lands of uh, Bukovina, which belonged to Moldova, passed to Aust Austria, and uh, a mixed populations, which were mainly uh, Ukrainian or Rus speaking and Romanian speaking and Moldavian speaking, uh, they also became the part of um, Austria and later Austrian-Hungarian Empire. After the Russian-Turkish Wars, uh, the Bessarab Gubernia was managed in uh, Russian Empire, and here you can see the map of this Bessarab Gubernia. So each was created on the territory, and then it was uh, it was constructed as the separate prov province and uh, became the significant part for uh, Russian internal and, and external policy. So um, here we can see that uh, the uh, 18 and beginning of, of 19th century was very uh, crucial for Moldavian lands. And that was the same tensions concerning Ukrainian lands because it also was divided by different states and Ukrainian lands similar to Moldavians were in, included into the part of different empires. Main of them were Austrian and Russian empires. So in this sense, we can see similar processes which occurred with Moldavian people and Ukrainian people. From one point of view, the process of uh, in, integration into the new Austrian empire. From another point of view, the open and very aggressive um, policy of Russification which took part, took part in the Russian Empire, especially in the 19th century, but that's completely another topic for 
for discussion. So that's really very, very important. Uh, because I'm representing Bukovina and that's a very important part of my life, I just want to show you the map of Bukovina in contemporary boundaries. And here you can see the um, ethnic map of Bukovina. So I hope you can see it. Yes. So we can see uh, pro probably data are not so correct, but you, we can see here the uh, Ukrainians, Russians, also uh, Romanians, Jews, Poles, and Roma people. But that's very interesting. And that's a question which I am asking myself, and not only I am asking, especially after 1991, why in many maps and in many investigations, we can't find the uh, results or numbers on um, Moldavian population in a uh, different part of Bukovina. I will show you another map with another data and we will compare that. So just shortly after the entering uh, or entrance Bukovina into Austrian empire, we can find some steps which were provided by Austrian authorities. And um, I will not talk a lot about it because I am sure that uh, you are more in familiar about that. But uh, in 1849, Bukovina became the separate crown land of empire. And if you look on this map, not from the ethnic, but from the ge geographical point of view, we can see that it included not only Ukrainian, but also uh, Moldavian, historical Moldavian lands. A uh, new policy which was provided here was really very important because it was like the mirror of everyday communication and interaction uh, of people who were living on this territory. So first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about the pattern on tolerance, the freedom of religion, equality for Orthodox and other Christians uh, with Catholics. And that was very important because it uh, put it the official uh, basic for further tolerant interaction and perception of different nationalities by which Bukovina is famous till today, till nowadays. And that's very important part of our um, image and image of, of the land from which I came. In 1782, we also uh, witnessed some um, colonies and some other nationalities who came into uh, these territories. So we can see here the interactions, not only the traditional peoples who were living here, like Ukrainians, uh, Moldovans, Romanians, Jews, Roma, etc., but also some German colonies who came to here and the new inter-ethnic relations which has been started to build on this territory. And that was also very, very important. Uh, for me personally, it's very important to understand how was built the uh, understanding, uh, how, how was provided the census in 18th century. And we can talk that the main point was the religion. And because Ukrainians, Romanians, Moldavians were Orthodox, the division between this these uh, nations was more complicated than, from, for example, division between Ukrainians and Pol 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 Poles or Ukrainians and Jews. Uh, here we can see also the map with the demographic composition of Bukovina in 1910. And we can see here that uh, the northern part was more settled by uh, Ukrainians. Yeah, and the southern part was more settled by the Romanians and Moldavians. But also we can see the ethnic composition of the population of Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And if you look attentively, we can see that people who were living there were not also only of different nationalities, but they needed this tolerant attitude. So at the beginning of 20th century, we can see that the traditional interactions of mutual understanding and understanding people was um, added by uh, official attitude. And that was really important for further uh, interaction on this territory. World War I I, uh, was the war which has, of course, its own roots. And that's uh, like very important part of 
my contemporary vision of contemporary world because I am sure that because of an unsolved questions and problems of the First World War, we have such problems at the beginning of the 21st century. But uh, the First World War demonstrated the willingness of different people which were living in different parts of uh, the world for their sovereignty and for their national state. So uh, World War II showed the weaknesses of different states and the weaknesses of imperial attitude for building the world. Uh, in 1917, 1918, just during the, the First World War, we see the attempts both Moldavians and Ukrainians to build their own sovereign states. So in 1917, on December 15, there was the, the proclamation of the Moldavian Democratic Republic, which uh, was the uh, the territory of which was a part of the former Russian Empire. The idea was to proclaim the autonomy, but not to cut the ties with the uh, Russian, um, Russian, but Russian not empire, but republic, because uh, Moldavian people strongly believed that it's possible. The same situation was in Ukraine. So in this sense we can not only to compare but uh, probably to have more bright and more um, clear the picture of the beginning of 20th century on that part of the territory because both all, almost all nations with, which have been started which, which have been uh, started the uh, way for building the independent states inside the Russian empire during the First World War, firstly didn't want to cut any ties with the uh, St. Petersburg as the capital of the former Russian empire and new Russian Republic. So they strongly believed in possibility to make it the democratic one. So Ukrainian state, which was also proclaimed in 1917, Ukrainian People Republic, also firstly announced that they want to become so sovereign, but they want to keep strong ties with the uh, new democratic Russian Republic. To be honest, um, the situation on both Moldavian and Ukrainian lands wasn't so simple and new uh, Russian Republic didn't want to let them out and to allow him uh, to build their own sovereignty and interaction between these two territories and these two states were more or less active because both needed the mutual recognition and mutual perception. Both of them needed to build new relations inside and outside of the familiar space. Uh, in 1918, it, uh, Moldavian uh, Democratic Republic was liquidated on December 10, and um, and to be uh, and on March 27, 1918, um, it 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 was included uh, into the uh, Romanian state. So um, it was finally liquidated by the decree of the, of, of Romanian King Ferdinand the first. Uh, in 1918. Uh, Ukrainian People's Republic uh, had a little bit longer history, so it developed a little bit longer because of uh, objective uh, circumstances. Uh, here we can see not only Ukrainian, but also the Western Ukrainian Republic. And in 1919, we can state that uh, just in January, uh, they were united into one big state, but that was more formally than in fact. And the war which occurred on the on Ukrainian lands led to the destroying Ukraine and cut it into the uh, several pieces. Uh, after that, uh, it was uh, divided between new Soviet uh, Union and uh, Romania, Poland and Czechoslovakia. The Second World War demonstrated the weaknesses of, uh, of the new geopolitical rule, which was uh, adopted by the, after this First World War. And we saw that uh, both players, like Germany and Soviet Union, wanted to share or to spread their ideology all over the world. And both Ukrainian and Moldavian lands became the object 
for uh, realizing these aims in this part of Europe. So to be honest, we can see this uh, everyday probably interaction inside different states. We can see the suffering from the policy of Russification and Romanization, which was occurring on these uh, territories, uh, which became the part of the Soviet Union and Romanian Kingdom in interwar period. But from another point of view, we can also see the uh, strong national resistance inside two uh, nations in interwar period and also during the Second World War. Contemporary boundaries of uh, these two states were formed just before, during, and after the Second World War. You had the separate lecture which was dedicated to the Transnistrian problem and to, to Transnistria and to the creation of contemporary Moldova, so I will not talk a lot. But as far as you know, the Autonomy Republic of Moldova was created in, 20, in 1924 in frames of, uh, of Ukrainian Soviet Socialistic Republic. And in um, and on November 4, 1914, the separate Moldavian Soviet Socialist, Socialist Republic was created in frames of the Soviet Union because main uh, part of, of, of historical Moldavian lands were included into the Soviet Union in 1940 uh, after the uh, division which was done by the Pact of molotov ribbentrop also, we can uh, and aggressive policy of both states. Ukrainian territory was formed longer, so 1939, the territories of contemporary Ivano-Frankivsk, Lviv, and Ternopil were included to the uh, Ukrainian Socialist Republic. Later, 1940, the same as. Um, Bessarabia, uh, Bukovina was uh, included to the Ukrainian Soviet, Soviet so so Socialist Republic. And after the first or Second World War in 1945, uh, Trans, uh, Transcarpathia or Zakarpatia was included. Uh, of course, I think that all of us are asking about the Crimea, and it was uh, included into the uh, um, frames of Ukraine in 1954. It wasn't a gift, but that's also the separate question. And if you want, you can ask it. But to be honest, if we are looking on um, further development of Ukrainian and Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic during the Soviet uh, uh, ruling, yeah, we can see uh, some common features and to be honest, very close cooperation and interaction on a regional level. So Chernivtsi and Odessa region, Chernivtsi and Odessa oblast, we have the most part, uh, the great part of Moldavians who are living on, on the territories of these two oblasts because they are border regions, uh, interacted very much on regional level uh, during the Soviet times. We have the representatives of uh, part nomenclature of Moldavian and Ukrainian origin, which uh, worked both in Moldova and Ukraine. We have a uh, very good experience uh, in cultural events and intercultural uh, cooperation and communication. But just uh, after, just only after the crash of the Soviet Union, uh, the new stage of relations between Ukraine and Moldova was settled. So from one point of view, we can talk about the uh, closer interaction in national frames, because only after the crash of the Soviet Union, both nations started uh, the policy of returning to their roots. And for example, uh, both Moldavians in Ukraine and Ukrainians in Moldova started to learn not only their own language, but also the language of the states in which they occurred. So Ukrainian and Moldavian, and that's very important because during the Soviet ruling, uh, on regional level, the representatives of national minorities, so Ukrainian in Mo Ukrainians in Moldova or Moldavians in Ukraine, uh, had a right to learn their own language, so national language like Ukrainian or Moldavian, and also they had to know definitely Russian language, but they shouldn't know. Moldavian or Ukrainian, uh, so the language of the Republic where they lived. 
So that was one of the most important questions of the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, for Ukrainians in Moldova and for Moldov Moldavians in Ukraine. They knew native and Russian, and they didn't knew, knew Ukrainian. They knew Ukrainian and Russian, or just Russian in Moldova, but they didn't know uh, Ukrainian language. The crash of the Soviet Union opened the new question, the question about the identity. And the identity question is also almost similar both for Ukrainians and Moldavians. For me personally, that's very important because it's connecting us into not only one probably space, but into the one community of searching our own identities. Because here you can see the map of the results of the Ukrainian census 2001. And you can see that mainly Moldavian population is living in Chernivtsi Oblast. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, here in Chernivtsi Oblast and also in Odessa. So that's tradition. And here we can find the Republic of Moldova, contemporary Republic of Moldova. Uh, to be honest, the, uh, before that, the previous census was provided in 1989, and by this data we had more, for example, in Chernivtsi Oblast, uh, percentage, higher percentage of Moldavian population, less percentage of Romanian population, uh, higher percentage of Russian, and less percentage of uh, Ukrainian. Under this census, we can see the changing of identity. So the number of Romanians, for example, both in Chernivtsi and Odessa region became higher and the number of Moldavians became lower. The number of Ukrainians became a little bit higher and the number of Russian people became a little bit lower. That wasn't because people left this territory. That was because they changed their identity or their understanding of identity. So we have people who identified themselves in 1990, for example, as Moldavian people, and who in 2001 identified themselves as Romanian. And that's like the question of identity or self-identification, which is still actual for uh, both Ukrainians and uh, Moldavians. And of course, from my personal point of view, uh, for Moldavians, uh, it's, it's really very important because just uh, as far as I can see, uh, in Ukraine, under Ukrainian law and under Ukrainian census, we have uh, we are recognizing Moldavian language as a separate one. And when we are providing census, we are um, separating the Moldavians as a separate nation and Moldavian language. So that's also a very important uh, question on identification. Here you can see also the map of Chernivtsi Oblast, where uh, I came from. And we have several, this is the old uh, administrative division. Today we have another one, but here it's easier to show uh, the uh, number of the, the uh, districts which are mainly settled by Moldavian population. And we can find here Novoselitsa, so the district uh, where we have a uh, higher level of uh, Moldavian population. So here you can see Novoselitsa. Also, we, we have Storozhenets. So also that uh, rayon of Chernivtsi Oblast where we have uh, representatives of Ukrainian, Moldavian, Russian, and Romanian population. And they're interacting every day on all levels. And that's very important. And that's very interesting because we have Novoselitsa and Starozhenets where by census 2001, we have prevailed number of Moldavian population. Hliboka, where we have more uh, high representativeness of uh, Romanian people. And Herza, where more than 90% of population are recognized as in themselves as uh, Romanians. So that's um, very important. Here you can see the like uh, colored uh, national division. And you can see here uh, the districts or the places where uh, Moldavian population plays the huge role in Chernivtsi Oblast by census 2001. We didn't provide census uh, in years before that, so you know that it has to be provided once 10 years, but we didn't. I hope we will, we will be able to provide it next 
or this year, but I'm not sure because of war. But to be honest, we need it because we have no uh, regional and uh, proficient data about the situation, demographic situation in Ukraine. And this identity question is really very important for both sides because um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, everybody started to ask him or herself about who am I and what am I. And in this sense, what we were talking about before that uh, was and still is very important because, uh, of course, from Ukrainian point of view, the interactions which was held during the ancient period of time, medieval period of history, new and contemporary history was more than important for our common uh, space and for our common understanding, perception, and acceptance. Uh, from another point of view, we also see, and those who, who research the contemporary Moldavian-Romanian relations uh, can find different evidences and different resources about the mutual understanding and interaction between these two nations. And we also have a lot of different questions about identity and identif identification, about the uh, names and about the states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So national identity is still very important. And as far as we can see, the um, Ukraine right now is on its way of building uh, national political identity. And that's very important in frames of the war which we are um, pushed to, to provide right now. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, as far as I've told, uh, all people who lived on that space, including me, of course, I was much more younger, uh, ask who am I and what do I feel? And to be honest, I can state from my own point of view and probably some of you can also, if you have any questions, I, will, I am open for that. Um, my perception of myself. I had no any problems with my ethnic identity because both of my parents are Ukrainians and I felt very good in this. I knew that in Chernivtsi and in Chernivtsi Oblast, we had a lot of uh, Moldavian people and we had the separate Moldavian uh, broadcasting uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right now, it turned and it's calling Romanian broadcasting, but that's another question. Also, we had some questions about political identity. And of course, from one point of view, I had no any question that I'm Ukrainian by citizenship. But I remember myself when I was very small, when I was a child, when I was around 10 years old, and that was Soviet Union, and I identified myself as a Soviet citizen. So I can see from my own point of view, this changing of identity. Linguistic and regional, that's very important one, especially linguistic for uh, so-called Russian speaking world, Ukrainian speaking world, Moldavian speaking world, Romanian speaking world, German, et cetera, et cetera. These uh, questions probably are not so actual for the states which uh, were managed decades ago. But this question is very important for the states like Ukraine and Moldova, for example, which are struggling for their European and for their national future. Because such cases as linguistic and national and ethnic identity are becoming the instrument of political influence for you on Ukraine and Moldova from Russia. And that also is very important for all of us uh, nowadays. And uh, just several words. I was sure that I will complete much more faster. I'm sorry if I am speaking too long. Um, uh, just um, after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and accept identity questions, which are really very important. And we have a lot of different national community and I'm proud and I'm glad that, for example, in Chernivtsi, we still have uh, national organizations and NGOs and uh, cultural uh, organizations, uh, Moldavian, Romanian, uh, Jews, German, Pol Polish, etc., etc., and of course, you, including U Ukrainian. I am proud that in Republic of Moldova, we have strong Ukrainian diaspora, and uh, there are a lot of Ukrainian communities and organizations, and that's very important from my personal point of view. 
And uh, to be honest, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukrainian uh, Moldavian relations were not very simple. Because from one point of view, uh, we started our way for, to our sovereignty. From another point of view, and you were discussed each uh, with your uh, previous lecture on Transnistria, Moldova witnessed very fast, even before the collapse, the Transnistrian problem and the influence of Moscow in its in, uh, internal affairs. And Ukraine hadn't suffer, suffered from that. But from 2014, uh, Ukraine uh, had a Russian invasion and annexed Crimea and uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. And uh, from February 24, 2022, we have no any secure place in Ukraine uh, because of Russian invasion and Russian bombing and Russian terrorism. And just to keep in mind and just probably to ask about some interactions and mutual perception uh, about the uh, from one point of view common policy of moscow towards ukraine and moldova and some kind of equality between two states yes this interruption via transnistria or donetsk and luhansk or crimea and from another point of view uh the question about so very quick annexation of crimea in 2014 and transnistria which asked for including it into the administrative uh, into into the frames of the uh, contemporary Russia, and Russia didn't react on it, and that's also the political games which are providing for dividing societies, both Ukrainians and Moldavian, because in this case, uh, radical political forces, bots, and uh, propagandists can use it for ruining the common. Um, understanding between our people. To be honest, uh, from 2014 till today, we feel strong mutual support and understanding from the Republic of Moldova. Here you can see uh, the place, uh, secure place for Ukrainian refugees after the February 24, 2022. We have a common uh, tribal initiative, uh, Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine for entering the European Union. We have a number of different cultural, political, infrastructural, and other initiatives, and we have very good educational and cultural interaction between both our states. So, um, to be honest, uh, from ancient time till today, uh, my personal feeling and feeling of many Ukrainians uh, that uh, the understanding and perception between two our people is, is very high. And our colleagues from different cities of Moldova are always supporting us and we are trying to support our common initiatives in research, in culture, in science, etc. So here you can find some sources which were used and thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that you have some questions and some remarks and probably some comments on, on my report. Thank you.